I'll just um, whip through a few of the surgical features. I guess Phil's covered the who and how thing fairly effectively. Maybe a few pictures are in order. I don't know if it's clear to the non-congenital audience, but the severe pulmonary stenosis with the trilogy of fallow is generally managed by excising the pulmonary valve and creating a, some sort of patch on the outflow tract to open it up completely, which means these patients have no pulmonary valve from the time of repair, which typically would be in the first year or two of life. The other group that we're talking about are the people who've got lesions like trachocyteriosis or pulmonary atresia VSD where there's no connection between the heart and the pulmonary arteries and they have an actual conduit going from the right ventricle to the pulmonary artery. And those people end up needing something done to their pulmonary, to replace the pulmonary valve and rehabilitate the system, relieve obstructions, fix branch pulmonary artery obstructions and all those other things. This, the commonest ones are the late post tetralogy but people who've had pulmonary valvectomies for those dysplastic pulmonary valves that Lisa Thomas talked about there's a significant group of long survivors with pulmonary atresia with intact ventricular septum who were born with a right ventricular outflow, either critical stenosis or atresia with a ductus dependent circulation as a baby. They tend to do pretty well and we end up putting pulmonary valves in those people too because they've usually ended up with pre-pulmonary regurgitation. The pulmonary autograft operation um, has had considerable success for aortic valve replacement and those patients 20 years down the line end up needing a pulmonary valve replacement too. Less common, less obvious to the non-congenital audience would be the transposition with ventricular septal defect in which the neo-pulmonary the neo valve, the arterial aortic valve originally is, is moderately, is significantly stenotic because the, if you've got a VSD, generally instead of having your pulmonary and aortic valves about the same size, your pulmonary valve is much bigger and becomes the aortic in this setting when you do an arterial switch and you end up with a stenotic pulmonary valve. Carcinoid we've heard talked about uh, pulmonary valve replacement very occasionally is something worth doing for carcinoid as the valve is very fibrotic and it really doesn't work all that well and a pulmonary valve replacement is relatively straightforward and safe to do. This is just tetralogy of fallow contrasting the normal heart with equal size outflow tracts and no septal defect with the VSD and pulmonary stenosis, hypoplasia of the pulmonary arteries. And these people do really well. The survival is excellent once they've been treated. The typical patient who's had a tetralogy repair often has a great big patch in their right ventricular outflow tract and they often have areas below it where the right ventricles become infarcted and we, we try to avoid the coronary arteries but in practice when you sew a patch in you do a big right, a right ventriculotomy they end up with an area of infarction so they often have quite dysfunctional right ventricles with large um, akinetic or even dyskinetic areas in them. Pulmonary regurgitation is bad for you. It uh, causes arrhythmias, particularly VT, which can lead to sudden death and it's a late cause of mortality in, in this group. And the more extreme ones can get atrial fibrillation and flutter. Tricuspid regurgitation, we try to avoid. That's definitely an indication to intervene when they start developing that. These days, mercifully, in our group, we rarely see tricuspid regurgitation when we've got to do their pulmonary. Anything wrong with the pulmonary arteries also predisposes any increased afterloads to the right ventricle and you need to replace. This, I won't worry about that. This is a still of the sort of thing with a gigantic right ventricle in a person with a flattened interventricular septum. And this is the, the late post tetralogy that's been going a little bit too long. Uh, occasionally endocarditis, particularly seeing a bit with the melody valves now, but also native RV outflow reconstructions, they seem to get a, a soup sign of endocarditis, which we need to do replacements for in some cases. Patients who get VT with their dilated right ventricle clearly need something done. Mainly it's related to symptomatic issues. If the patient has symptoms then of exercise limitation, which are often slow and progressive, uh, it's worth doing something about them. The surgical options haven't changed much. Homographs have a place, much more commonly used in children. In adults, I'm personally using them much less than I used to, but there are situations where they work well. The standard bioprostheses are good um, for various reasons which I'll briefly go into. Stentless bioprostheses are also possible. I only mention the Gore-Tex monocusp and the various monocusp things to say that they usually don't work. 
and mechanical, whilst you can be on warfarin and you can get away with it in the pulmonary situation, they have a tendency to thrombose or to fibrose, so they become progressive limitation of leaflet movement and they don't generally work all that well. We've got a handful of patients with them and I've taken a few of them out and they basically, we try to avoid them. The typical right ventricular outflow tract post tetralogy has a very big diameter. It's a very short distance from the annulus to the origin of the right pulmonary artery and a small homograft is all it'll fit without it being distorted. So the <coughs> homografts work well in some situations like post ROS procedure and post transposition with VSD where it's an isoanatomical situation where it's a straight shot from the RV to the pulmonary arteries. They'll, con they'll tolerate a bit of compression from the sternum um, and it's nice stuff to work with. It operates a bit like native tissue although dead cardiac muscle doesn't sew all that well in some people in some donated devices. Um, homographs disadvantages, they're very long in the big sizes and we try to avoid the big sizes these days because we're looking for a percutaneous valve as the next shot and the 22 millimetre size for the Melody valve has allowed us to, we tended to use smaller homographs than we used to. This is just a picture, this is an aortic homograft with the mitral leaflet attached and these are fine for pulmonary valves, you just trim them up, so off the coronaries. Standard bioprosthesis works very well and because it's got a single suture line the short distance between the annulus and the pulmonary artery can be accommodated with a single suture line and a completely competent valve that's very reliable. I've been putting these things in for 15 years and touch wood, it's extremely uncommon that they deteriorate before that. They seem to be quite long lived once you get over about 20 or 25. In the children definitely you're looking at a 10 year time frame for a good homograft and it can be a lot shorter. So they're durable on the low pressure side and they're available. Homographs of course have issues. Just briefly about the surgical issues, you get a lot of re-operations, some of them have had a lot of operations. I've done two seventh time redos in the last six months. Um, it's one of those things that you try to avoid whittling away at them too much. But it's, it's one of those areas where they do have issues. The rear dystonotomy is always a hazard because the RV is always big. Sometimes the aorta, particularly in transposition and variations where the aorta is anterior because of the congenital disease. Femoral bypass if it's under the sternum with deep hypothermic arrest even if the aorta is stuck to the back of the sternum. I'll show you a few a little example of that. And you don't have to do a hell of a lot at surgery, you just need to cannulate the right atrium, you have the heart beating, you sew the valve in with the heart beating. This is just an example of a post tetralogy case. This is a young man who had an aberrant origin of the left anterior descending artery from the right coronary and you can see here that his right coronary artery sits immediately behind the sternum and the saw blade's got to go through there. A little bit further up his aorta is stuck to the back of the sternum for his third operation and that's his degenerate calcified homograft with a touch of pulmonary valve stenosis there. And it, when they blew the balloon up for the melody valve to see whether or not it would be okay, it compresses the LAD so he has to have a surgical solution. And in this case, just put him on femoral bypass and cooled him down and unzipped his aorta and only made a small hole in it so I was able to control it digitally and stitch it up. But this is the sort of hazard that one has with this group of patients. Um, just to talk about remodelling procedures, this would be a typical, I always try to put the biggest possible valve in, the biggest size they make convenient, there's a 29 millimetre and that can go in most adult patients. Small individuals and females occasionally put a 27 in. The idea being to have as big as possible diameter so it will stenose as late as possible and they're amenable to a transcatheter device as a valve in valve. Uh, typically I augment the outflow tract with some autologous or mostly bovine pericardium just so you can get the big valve in. It's worth spending the extra time. Um, sometimes we can remodel plicate or modify the shape in some way to improve the heat aneurysm in the right ventricle or out in the right ventricle. Um, we do whatever we need to do to the pulmonary arteries including recruiting them and re revising them. Very occasionally these people get VT and very rarely you can do a, a VT type operation of pulmonary valve replacement. I'll show this partly just to, with a beating heart and uh, with needle electrodes you can map it and determine where the VT is and then radio frequency ablate it. It's been less 
necessary in the last 10 years with defibrillators, but people with really frequent VT don't do well with defibrillators. So this is the instant gratification side of the surgery for tetralogy of fallow type patients. You see the big dilated right ventricle here in the pre-bypass echo. And in the post-bypass echo, the right ventricle's half the size and generally will improve further. You see how it's still pretty thick walled. And these right ventricles, um, if you get them before they become excessively dilated, do extremely well in terms of size and function in the patient's improve quite markedly. So it improves all the right things that you'd hope for and it's good for you. Um, just an example of our sort of fairly recent series, the last 100 patients we've done in the Westmead area, um, excluding all the patients who had various other, more, more than just basically a pulmonary artery or conduit replacement. Uh, the indications of tetralogy of fellow were 57, so the majority, but there's a whole sipson of other things. Um, Regurgitation was the main reason. Some of them had some atrial fibrillation. Some of them had the pacemakers and defibrillators in place. They weren't in hospital for very long. They were in intensive care for fairly short periods of time. And they're all pretty well redos. I used bioprosthetic valves in 70% and 31% in homografts. Mostly big bioprosthetic valves, mostly 22 millimeter homographs to accommodate the melodies. And we did a few other odds and ends in these. I've excluded the ROS procedures and the other ones who have more other interventions which would increase their mortality risk. 30-day um, mortality is zero. It's reoperating a couple for bleeding, no major infections or other major problems, no strokes, a little bit of new atrial fibrillation. So really it's a relatively safe procedure, short hospital stay, rapid recovery. And if you can set it up so that the interventionalists can have a free shot with a good sized annulus to work with, you can keep them out of the operating room for an awful long time. And that certainly is, is my goal. And I think it's, it's a very rewarding area to work in because the patients generally do.